Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. My father used to say, where God places a period, let no man put a question mark. The point was that we should reverentially accept the teachings of Scripture instead of doubting or challenging them. Of course, there is more than one way to ask a question. Some questions are inappropriate and disrespectful. Perfect illustration of the maxim, where God places a period, let no man put a question mark, is the temptation in the garden. God issued a plain, direct command, and Satan challenged it with a question in Genesis 3, verse 1. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The point of the question was to begin to undermine God's command. The follow-up from Satan was a flat denial of the command. In verse 4, you will not surely die. The adversary placed just in Eve's mind that she accepted an alternate interpretation of the original command. Beware of alternate interpretations to simple, straightforward scriptures. Paul writes of inappropriate questions in Titus 3, verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. Again, in 2 Timothy 2, 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. In his word pictures of the New Testament, A.T. Robertson says the word ignorant indicates one who is untrained, uneducated. And then Robertson references Perry, who defined this word to indicate speculations of a half-educated mind. Finally, we have in 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 and 4, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes, the King James Version says questions, and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. The Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary reads on this passage, He is proud, literally, wrapped in smoke, filled with the fumes of self-conceit while knowing nothing, namely, of the doctrine which is according to godliness, though arrogating preeminent knowledge, doting about, literally sick about, the oppo opposite of wholesome, uh, of wholesome or healthy. Truth, he continues, is not the center about which his investigations move, but mere word strifes. Burton Kaufman cites the following translations and paraphrases of this passage in his commentary. He is blinded with conceit and really knows nothing, but is crazy with discussions and controversies about words, according to Weymouth. He is a conceited, ignorant person with a morbid craving for speculations and arguments, good speed. He is a conceited, ignorant creature with a morbid passion for controversy and argument, Moffat. You ever known anyone like that? The Phillips translation is so pointed, I ought to omit it from this list, lest some be offended. As Gould remarked, this is about as close to invective as the apostle ever came. Some types of questions should obviously be disregarded. The scriptures are clear. And yet, we read of Jesus at age 12 in Luke 2, verse 46, in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. While some, like the scribes and lawyers of Jesus' day, use the word of God as a perverse excuse for wrangling and fussing and fighting, others legitimately seek truth with their inquiries. This morning, we will address legitimate questions that have raised, been raised by you, our viewers. But first, enjoy our song. I'm in the
Judge Simon Greenleaf, skeptic turned believer and one of the founders of Harvard Law School, expressed the noble sentiment of the genuine truth seeker in the book he wrote with Joseph Salvador, An Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists. He wrote, there should be a readiness on our part to investigate with candor, to follow the truth wherever it may lead us, and to submit without reserve or objection to all the teachings of this religion if it be found to be of divine origin. Because there are sincere individuals who desire to know the truth that makes one free, John 8, 32, the Holy Spirit has commissioned the Christian to meet them halfway. Consider the message of 1 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. The same passage again from the New King James Version. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Note that this passage is not written merely to Christian leaders, but to Christians in general. Clearly, the Christian has an obligation to know what he believes and why. So, when others question him about his beliefs, he can respond with scriptures and reason. If you have Bible questions, we hope that you will relay them to us. A viewer from the Dallas, Texas area voiced concern over the words that appear every week on the board to my left. Be like Noah, save your family. The gentleman said that this statement is scripturally untrue, adding, it is evident that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, not a savior. Of course, we agree that Jesus is the savior of mankind. Too many scriptures make this clear. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 23, that Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Hosea 13, 4 reads, and you shall know God, you shall know no God but me, for there is no savior besides me. We embrace this truth. At the same time, we vigorously deny that the statement, be like Noah, save your family, is unscriptural. While Jesus is our lone literal Savior, a number of passages teach that human agents can play a role in the salvation of men. Six examples of such are as follows. Romans eleven fourteen. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 16. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? 1 Corinthians 9, 22. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. James 5, verse 20, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Jude, verse 23, But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Obviously, in a literal sense, only Jesus is able to save anyone. In the statement, be like Noah, save your family, the word save is used in the same way that Paul used it of himself, of Timothy, of husbands and wives. The most direct biblical link to the saying, be like Noah, save your family, is found in Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet prepared an ark for the saving of his household, his family. 
by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Barnes notes, reads of this passage, quote, in order that his family might be saved. The salvation here referred to, Barnes says, was preservation from the flood. Noah himself was empowered as God's messenger, 2 Peter 2, verse 5, to rescue his family from the flood and warn the rest of the world of their fate for rejecting God's message. Each of us have a sphere of influence and can have an impact on the eternal destiny of our friends, families, and other associations. Parents who still have their children at home need to be reminded of Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. While our children must choose for themselves to do right or wrong, to serve God or rebel against Him, we can have a profound influence on their moral decision-making. This is why the Holy Spirit established having faithful children, Titus 1, verse 6, as a qualification for men seeking to be elders. Some would consider Noah's failure as a pre Noah uh, a failure rather as a preacher since his congregation was limited at least initially to his family of eight. But can there be any greater success than being used as an instrument of God in saving your own family members? The next question comes from a viewer in southern Missouri. Does an individual's financial condition indicate whether or not he has the favor of God. Some preachers actually teach that this is the case. We need first to acknowledge that the scriptures teach that the people of God who have been blessed financially should acknowledge God as the source of their prosperity. The apostle says as much in 1 Timothy 6 verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. But while God does give us richly all things to enjoy, this does not mean that all Christians will be rich, nor does it mean that the most wealthy are the most godly. In fact, in the same chapter, the Holy Spirit makes this point. We read in 1 Timothy 6, beginning in the second half of verse 5, men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. But we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we should be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." So God warns against chasing wealth as a journey fraught with great temptation, heartache, and pain. More than that, though, notice that God speaks in verse 5 of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. The Christian Standard Bible renders this passage, men whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. The English Standard Version has, people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. The Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary says on this verse, the Greek requires supposing regarding the matter in this point of view that piety, or what's translated godliness, is a means of gain, that is, a way of advancing one's worldly interests. So godliness does not produce great material gain, or everybody would be in, into it just to get wealthy. But instead, godliness with contentment is great gain. In Mark 12, verse 41 through 44, you remember Jesus pointed out that the most godly individual of the lot, of all those casting in their money in the treasury, was the poor widow woman who cast in her measly two mites. 
Moreover, Jesus said in Luke 6, 20, Blessed are ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. He then adds in verse 24, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. If we're going to generalize about the rich and the poor, we ought to do so in harmony with Scripture. The Bible says in James 2, verse 5 and 6, Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man is spiritually impoverished, and the beggar Lazarus is the one approved of God. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2, the Apostle Paul speaks of faithful Christians who were in deep poverty. Paul himself was poor, despite the fact that he was among the most diligent workers the church has ever knew. He says of himself in 2 Corinthians 11, 27, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Jesus himself had no place to where to lay his head. The scriptures are clear. The quality of one's relationship with God is not reflected by their level of material prosperity. The people of God are rich, poor, and everywhere in between. Another question received from Southern Missouri. Are we commanded to greet one another with a holy kiss when we assemble as the church? I like to just consider what Wayne Jackson writes in the Christian Courier because I think he answers this beautifully. There is absolutely no kiss one another per se as a method of greeting. And I know of no scholar who has ever argued that position. Kissing as a method of greeting had been practiced for centuries. See Genesis 27:26. Genesis 29, 13, 1 Samuel 20, 41, 1 Kings 19 and 20, Matthew 26, verse 49. The thing commanded by the New Testament writers was that the practice be holy and in love, agape, in the genuine spiritual interest of another. He continues, Jackson does, there is not a single passage in which the greeting kiss is mentioned, but what the admonition is not qualified by a modifying term. Romans 16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 13, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, 1 Peter 5, 14. In view of this, one is bound to conclude that the instruction concerning the holy kiss is as binding today as it ever was. No Christian will ever be allowed to greet his brother or sister in lust, treachery, or hypocrisy. A viewer from Kentucky writes, On the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, how could 3,000 people have been immersed? They wouldn't have had enough time or water, would they? This question addresses whether or not circumstances of Acts chapter 2 demanded that the penitent believers either be sprinkled instead of immersed or that many people were not actually physically baptized in water at all. The scriptures are clear that baptism is immersion. John 3, verse 23, the Bible says that John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there. When Philip baptized the eunuch in Acts 8, 38, the Bible says they both went down into the water and then they came up out of the water. These details would be peculiar if sprinkling could be substituted for immersion. Why to go to all that trouble? We learn further from Romans 6, verse 4 through 6, and Colossians 2, 12, that baptism was a burial. This harmonizes with immersion, but not sprinkling. That would destroy the picture. Instead of using rantizo, the Greek word for sprinkling, we find the word translated baptism. W. Vine, in his expository dictionary of New Testament words, defines baptisma, baptism, consisting of the process of immersion submersion and emergence from the root word bapto which means to dip. Luther, Calvin, and Wesley acknowledged that the New Testament practice was immersion. In an attempt to counter all the evidence that baptism is immersion uh, or even that baptisms took place at all, some suggest that there wasn't enough time or water in Jerusalem to immerse 3,000 in one day. First, remember that even if only the 12 were baptizing, there would have been plenty of time. 3,000 divided by 12 would be 250. Immersion is not a lengthy process. 
after hearing the subject confess Christ, that would take about five seconds, and make the statement like, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins, 10 seconds, the one baptizing would lower the subject slowly under the water and raise them up again, another 10 seconds. Then the next subject can join, could join the one baptizing, which would take about 30 seconds and restart the process. In this way, one person could be baptized per minute. 250 could be baptized in about four hours. There would be plenty of time. The fact that they were all baptized in that day shows the extreme urgency of baptism. These people knew that baptism is where their sins would be forgiven, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. Bill Grasham writes in an article entitled Archaeology and Christian Baptism in the Restoration Quarterly, quote, over 300 stepped and plastered immersion pools have been discovered in Israel. Of these, about 150 have been found in Jerusalem, dating from the first century B.C. to the end of the second temple period, A.D. 70. The facts support the biblical account of immersion in water. Well, I hope you'll stay with us until after our song, and we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message. We have time to notice a, a couple more scriptures that address some of the issues we looked at today. First of all, when we're talking about the relationship between parents and children, we need to do, as we've got written here on the screen, be like Noah. Save your family. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Moving to another uh, topic that we looked at, let's go to Romans chapter 6. And here in Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 3, we see that the idea of a burial is inherent in the, in the idea of baptism. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. This is not the only passage. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, we find again that baptism is spoken as a burial, buried with Christ. Now, immersion fits with the idea of a burial, but sprinkling cannot be harmonized with this term. Well, we... Thank you so much for watching Let the Bible Speak. 
If you'd like to get a free transcript or a free DVD of this sermon, number 815-815, Be Like Noah, Questions and Answers, please write the address to follow. And we would like to hear from you and receive your questions. We also offer our Bible study course to complete at home. Join our group page on Facebook for updates on the sermon that airs each week. Of course, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.